Good morning. Welcome to Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. Let's all stand together as we sing an old favorite. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. Let's sing it together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Psalm 100 says, let's enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Let's be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. For the Lord, he is good and his mercy endureth all generations. Worship with us as we sing.
the Lord's mercy, his love endures forever. Go ahead. <laughs> Jeremy referenced that Psalm 100. That's what they just sang. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all your lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know you that the Lord, he is God. And it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. For we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Amen. So we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. That's just what the word says. Amen. We serve a good, good God this morning. If you're thankful to be in the house of God this morning, just say amen. amen. Thank you so much for being here. We welcome you. We thank you for coming and being a part of the service this morning. And if this is your first time, maybe second time, and you've never stopped by one of our welcome desks to fill out a connect card. Would you do that this morning? Uh, you can also uh, stop by our next steps. We can get some information from you there, but we've just got a small gift as a token of appreciation for you coming and worshiping with us here at Mount Pisgah today. Let me also welcome those of you that are watching via the live stream. Uh, we know many that are sick and uh, walking through some tough times, and we're glad that you have decided to join us via live stream. I get texts that it seems every Sunday morning that says, hey, pastor, we're out of town, but we're praying for you, and we'll be watching online. And I want to tell you, listen, those of you that are watching online, that is an encouragement to your pastor, and I appreciate that. And then those of you that are sitting inside the worship center this morning, what a great encouragement it is to see almost a full worship center on a Sunday morning that's negative 35 degrees outside. And I'm glad you braved the cold and came. Amen? Thank you for being here. I also want to offer just a word of thanks. None of you would ever know this, but yesterday afternoon at about three or four o'clock, the main water line that comes from out of Highway 88 into our building busted. And when I say the main water line busted, I'm talking about the main water line that was putting out some significant water. And Late yesterday afternoon, early evening, I wasn't sure we would be able to be here this morning because we had no water. But some men in this church got together. They started digging up the sidewalks, digging up the parking lot, trying to find, found it late last night, and in the bitter cold, got it fixed. And they would never want me to tell you who they are, so I'm not going to. I had one of them tell me one time, he said, if you ever tell anybody what I did, I won't do anything else again. So I'm not going to tell you who that is, but it wouldn't take you but a couple of guesses. But thank you to a church that just dropped everything and guys in this church that just dropped everything to make sure we could be here this morning and have service together. Amen. I am so grateful for people with a servant's heart. Let me mention just a couple of quick announcements. Women's ministry kickoff today at 4.30. So if you are a woman, we don't have anybody here transitioning, you know if you're a woman or not. <laughs> if you're visiting, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of... 4.30 today in the well. Great time of fellowship with some other ladies. You've been here for a little while and you haven't got a chance to meet some of the other ladies. Please come out today at 4.30 and hear some of our vision for our men, uh, women's ministry in the days ahead. And then Thursday, uh, you guys will be starting the Elijah Bible study. And uh, that will begin on Thursday. There's a session at 10.30 and a session also at 6.30. And uh, we're looking forward to doing that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you this afternoon. This coming Tuesday at 1030, our Prime Timers Bible study is still going on. This will be our last week. So you come out at 1030, and then we'll have a meal together after that. This weekend, men, Johnny Hunt Men's Conference. It's a great time. I plan to go, and I hope you do as well. You can see Hayden right after the service. 
or you can go on Realm and sign up, but we'll be going to that this weekend. And then next Sunday morning, I'm excited about next Sunday morning, Dr. Jerry Vines is going to be here preaching the morning service at Mount Pisgah next Sunday. You say, who is Dr. Jerry Vines? He was the pastor at uh, Jacksonville Baptist Church for a long, long time. Probably had the best pastor's conference for years and years and years and years. And if you're in a grow group, how many of you are in a grow group? He's the author of the grow group book that you are using right now. And so uh, a wonderful expositor of the word. I want you to be here next week and bring somebody with you to hear Dr. Jerry Vines. And then also, would you be praying now for our Dean Al weekend coming up in February? All of our youth will be coming together and having a weekend that is always a big weekend in the life of our church. So would you begin praying now that God would move in the hearts of our young people and in those that would be in leadership that weekend? Well, we're going to continue to worship in song, and we're going to hear about His mercy is more. My sins, they were many, but His mercy was more. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for a chance to be in your house this morning. And we pray, Lord, that this morning as we have gathered together, we would make much of Jesus. And Lord, you do a mighty work in the hearts of your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet. Praise the Lord. His mercy is
his mercy this morning. Thank you for the mercy that we've been shown, such amazing grace, and we bless your name this morning. Forever we'll praise you. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him need for us to be here today, but we serve a God who is alive now and forever will be. Amen. There never has been a time that he was not. 
for he has been alive and alive forevermore. You say, Pastor, they killed him. Yes. He said, I've got the power to lay my life down. I got the power to pick it back up again. So what do you think about that, devil? Amen. He's alive forevermore, and he is on the throne forever and forever and forever. And to that we say, hallelujah, the lamb has overcome. Today is a fifth Sunday. 100% of what you give today through the tithes and the offerings go towards our building fund. You say, Pastor, what are we going to build? Well, we're working on that now. And I hope that in the days and weeks to come, we'll be able to share something with you about a facility that we want to put together for our children and our preschoolers. And uh, you just be in prayer about that. But 100% of what you give today will go towards uh, the building fund. So you just be obedient today and uh, give as unto the Lord. Let me also mention just a few that we need to be praying for. Joanna Tinsley's father passed away yesterday. We're going to be praying for their dear family. Uh, also, Tootie Hall passed away this week. We'll be having her service tomorrow morning here in the worship center. Uh, visitation is at 10, and then the service will be at 11. So you pray for that dear family. We've got others that are facing upcoming surgeries, some that are recovering from surgeries, others that we have had uh, the services this past week. I've Since last Friday, I think I have done five funerals. It has just been a, a, a tough, tough time uh, in, in the life of our church and in the life of many family members that are in our church that have families outside of our church that uh, have gone to be with the Lord. But we praise the Lord that the grave is not the end. Amen. Paul said to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And so we don't say goodbye. We just say goodnight. I'll see you in the morning. But you pray for all of those that have been bereaved this week. And I pray for the services tomorrow and other upcoming services. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to meet with us as we go into the preaching time this morning and then be with all of those families that are walking through times of difficulty. Would you join me as we pray? Lord Jesus, thank you again for a time to gather together with a family of faith. Lord, you tell us in Hebrews 25 to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so, Lord, we've tried to be obedient to your word today as we have gathered together. And Lord, it is our desire today to worship you both in spirit and in truth. And so, Lord, I do pray that as we continue through this service, that, Lord, you would do the hearts, you would do the work in the hearts of people that only you can do, Heavenly Father, an eternal work. We thank you, Lord, for the one that was saved in the first service this morning and pray, Lord, you would save others today. And Lord, we do lift all of these up that are on our prayer list, those that have lost loved ones even this week. Lord, we pray you would be near and dear to each and every one of them. May they sense your peace and your presence like never before. And now, Lord, I pray that as we share, you would speak in a powerful, powerful way to your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. We're going to continue this morning in the book of Galatians. So if you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab it and open to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We have been in a series that we've entitled Delivered. And we understood from last week's study that Paul is warning these churches at Galatia about the Judaizers that have come in and they have tried to add something to the gospel. The Judaizers have told these young believers that they need to observe the Levitical law, that they need to be circumcised, they need to observe a kosher diet, and they've added things to the law. And Paul is writing a letter to these Galatians to clear up a few items of misunderstanding. And Paul is going to be very clear in his message. And so as we walk through this this morning, we saw last week that Paul, first of all, established his credibility. He said, I'm an apostle. And remember we said an apostle was one that had seen Jesus and then was also sent by Jesus. And so we saw Paul establishing his apostleship because they were attacking the man to try to discredit his message. The Judaizers also knew what they were up to. They knew they were distorting the gospel and they probably did it with good intentions, just unknowingly were adding to the gospel and they didn't want Paul to straighten things out. So they began to attack his character, trying to 
attack his message, but we saw last week Paul established his credibility, and then he expressed his convictions. Really, in the first few verses of Galatians, he begins to give them the good, glorious gospel when he says that Jesus gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present world according to the will of God. And so, Paul, after he establishes his, convic- his credibility and then expresses his convictions, he explodes in celebration. And Paul began to think about how saved he was, and it caused him to break out in doxology and begin to sing. Normally in Paul's letter, right after that first introduction, he would go into, I'm praying for you, we're praying for you, we're praying for you, But Paul skips that, and he's going to get to the meat of the matter very quickly in this letter. He wants to deal with these Judaizers Judaizers that have come in and caused these Gentile believers to begin to embrace something other than the true gospel. They were adding to grace. So Paul's going to correct this error. And he's going to establish that there is only one gospel. And I want to preach on this subject this morning, prone to wander. Prone to wander. It is easy for us sometimes to allow the culture to cause us to soften our message or to soften our positions. And this morning, I want us to walk through this as Paul does with this letter to the Galatians and telling them that there is no other gospel, so don't wander away from the one true gospel. So let's stand together and let's read Galatians chapter one, beginning in verse six. If you're there, would you say amen? Amen. Paul says this, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there would be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, Say, I now again. Paul Paul, Paul said, look, I've already said it once, but I'm going to say it again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ." Heavenly Father, I pray now as we walk through these verses that, Holy Spirit, you would be our teacher. And God, I pray that there would be conviction. And Lord, we would be quick to answer your call today. And Lord, I pray one more time for that touch that turns a mere mortal man into a messenger of the Almighty. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We must be careful today not to allow the culture to define what the gospel is for us. You see, the culture believes that our message is too narrow. The culture believes that we are not inclusive enough. So you and I as blood-bought, born-again believers cannot and should not be swayed by the culture on such an important topic as the one true gospel. Tim Keller wrote a book, and in this book, he began to interview some folks about the one true gospel. And this will give you some idea of where our culture is on the Word of God. You and I sitting inside this worship center this morning, it is not a surprise to you when I say to you, There is only one gospel, and there is only one way to heaven, and that is through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, and there is no other way. That is not surprising to you that are sitting inside of a Baptist church, but to most 
of this country and most of the world, they don't believe the way is that narrow. And so what we must do, according to chapter 5 here in Galatians in verse 1, is we must stand fast on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and not allow culture to sway us and soften our positions. Here's what one 24-year-old young man said. That was in downtown New York when he was being interviewed. He said this about the gospel. He said, how can you claim that your religion is superior It is arrogant to try to win someone to it. Surely all religions are good in meeting the needs of its particular followers. Another one that was interviewed there in downtown New York said this, religious exclusivity is not only narrow, it's dangerous. You see, that's what the culture thinks. The culture thinks because our way is narrow, and it's really not even our way, it's the Bible way, it's God's way. Because our way is narrow, and it's not inclusive enough, somehow we are dangerous to the world. Christians are dangerous to the culture. Listen, we ought to be dangerous to the culture. We ought to be changing it, amen? But I got news for you. Listen, I believe there's going to be pockets of revival that will take place across America. I believe God still moves in other places. Listen, God's doing mighty works in other places around the world. But I'm here to tell you, I don't know from reading the scriptures uh, that things ever get better before Jesus comes to get us. And so we are going to be pressured into softening our stance on the exclusivity of the gospel because we will be called bigoted because we stand on the one true gospel. Some of your favorite talk show hosts, one of them being Oprah, made this statement. Listen to this. One of the biggest mistakes people make is to believe that there is only one way. There are many paths that lead to what you call God. We all know that is error. Everybody in here should know. Listen, if you don't know that is error, my plea to you today is you need to know the one true God. Because all roads do not lead to heaven. Joel Osteen made this statement. I don't know how Jesus might reveal himself to somebody, so I'm just not going to exclude anyone from heaven. You see, that's the message of the culture, is that Jesus is at the top of a mountain, and there's a bunch of different roads that you can take, but ultimately we all get there. Whether you go through Buddha, whether you go through Muhammad, whether you go through just being a good person, all of these religions, we ultimately end up at the same place. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is an exclusive way. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, I got a good friend. He's a Buddhist, but he's a good guy. He, he, he is devout in what he believes. I've got a friend that is Hindu pastor and he is devout in what, and he's as good a guy as I've ever known. Listen, if he doesn't come to know Jesus, he will spend eternity in a place called hell. He said, that's pretty narrow. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Jesus also made this statement. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Stay with me here. How many ways were there to get in the ark? And it was through the door. Jesus said what? I am the door. Ain't but one way to avoid destruction, and that's through the door. But pastor, that's a pretty exclusive way. I mean, it's just not inclusive enough. Some people ought to be able to crawl through the windows. Oh, no. You go through the door. 
as it was in the days of Noah. Now, stay with me. How many people were saved from destruction in Noah's day? Eight. If you go to Answers in Genesis and begin to study what was going on in that time, a conservative estimate, a conservative estimate of the population of the earth in Noah's day, conservative estimate, 750 million people. Some have estimated as many as 4 billion. Eight. They tell us the population of the United States is 330 million. I don't know how they know that because they're coming in here by the droves every day. I don't know how they know that. <laughs> I just thought I'd capture your attention right there. I knew some of you just needed that icebreaker. 330 million people in the U.S. It's a pretty narrow way. And the truth is, there's likely people sitting in here. You're not on the narrow way. You've somehow convinced yourself that you're a good person. Somehow convinced yourself that because you don't cheat on your taxes and you treat people good and you don't lie to people and you're sincere, that somehow you're going to make it into heaven. You got to go through the door. And nothing more. Paul is going to make clear to these Galatian believers that these Judaizers that are coming into you, that are selling you another gospel, they are dangerous, 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 and they should not be listened to. So notice with me, first of all, the astonishment of Paul. The astonishment of Paul. Look what he says there in verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another <clears throat> gospel. Again, Paul's going <clears> to, <throat> he's going to get right to the point here. And he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed. He's astonished <clears throat> at a couple of things. Number one, he's astonished at their turning. Paul says, I am absolutely blown away. I am absolutely bewildered. I am amazed that you have already turned to another gospel, which is no gospel at all. I am amazed that after all of the teaching that I gave you, that you have now begun to listen to the teaching of these false teachers, these Judaizers that would add something to grace. I am absolutely blown away. Recently, I talked with a pastor friend of mine. Young couple in his church, been there just a short while, been saved, man, and they've been pouring into them. Well, they got a knock on their door one afternoon. It was a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. After about four weeks, this young couple who had gotten saved and gotten inside of a Bible-believing church were easily influenced by some Jehovah's Witnesses, and now they feel like they need to be down at the temple. And the pastor said, I was absolutely astonished at that. You see, if you don't know what you believe and why you believe it and have some scripture to go with it, you can easily be influenced by the culture and by false teachers. And Paul said, I am absolutely blown away. Astonished at their turning. He's also astonished at their timing. Look what he says. I marvel that you are what? So soon removed. Man, it didn't take y'all long. It's almost as if Paul had just left. And he says, I haven't been gone that long. And here you are already embracing false teaching. The Judaizers, man, their message of works is, is beginning to be embraced by these believers. And Paul says, how'd that happen so fast? You say, listen, pastor, I'll be honest with you. With me, it would never happen that fast. No way. How many of you have ever been to the doctor? This, this, well, I can't say that. I was about to say this hadn't happened to me, but it kind of has. You've been to the doctor, and he says, uh, 
Your cholesterol's up a little bit. Uh, your triglycerides are a little high. Blood pressure. It's creeping on up there. And you're about 25 pounds overweight. And it's time you do something or you're headed for trouble. When the doctor says that to you, bro, Jordan, you old skinny thing, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> In your mind, you begin preparing yourself for a life change, right? And you're, you're thinking, man, I'm going to eat some salad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink water. And, and man, you're trying to, trying to motivate yourself, right? Because you're right there. He's just told you that you need to get it together. You walk out to your car, man, and you're, you're pumping yourself up, man. Please tell me I'm not the only person that talks to yourself, right? You're pumping yourself up, right? Man, I'm going I'm to I'm 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 jog in the morning. I'm going I'm to you know, join the Y. Uh, I'm going to eat salads. Mm. with light dressing. <laughs> you just left the doctor's office. It's about lunchtime. <laughs> so you find yourself in the Chick-fil-A drive-thru. <laughs> and you plan to get a kale crunch salad, right? With the almonds and all that, right? And you pull up and they say, hey, welcome to Chick-fil-A. Can I scan your app? What would you have? You know, their chicken is not that bad. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just have a regular Chick-fil-A sandwich. Do you want the combo? Yeah. <laughs> what would you like to drink with that? Coke. Sweet tea. You just left the doctor's office. And you had all of these visions of grandeur of that six-pack you were going to have and just... I mean, we, listen, guys, we think we can get a six-pack in what? Four days, right? We eat salad for four days, and we think we're supposed to be, right? It should be that way, but it's just not. You just left the doctor's office, and you're eating a jumbo chili cheeseburger. How did it happen so fast? That's what Paul is saying here. How did this happen? I just left you, and you've begun to embrace this false teaching of these Judaizers. They've been taught by likely the greatest teacher to ever teach outside of Jesus, and yet they're finding themselves being pulled toward error. Listen to me. If you listen to the wrong teachers on television, if you listen to the wrong teachers in preaching, you can be pulled away from the truth. Listen to me. Be careful who you listen to. Doesn't take but a single drop of poison and a glass of water to kill you. Rat poison is more than 99% grain, less than a percent poison, and yet it kills. Paul was astonished at their turning. He was astonished at their timing. He was astonished at their trouble. Look at verse seven. He says, there's some that trouble you. And I've already touched on this, but Paul says, listen, these false teachers are going to cause you trouble. When you begin to embrace some of their false teaching, you're going to find yourselves in trouble. When you embrace the teaching that Jesus broke the law for you, you're going to find yourself in trouble. You say, pastor, somebody preaches that. Oh yeah, come right out of Charlotte. See, people get nervous when you begin to call out false teachers because they think, oh my gosh, preacher, you shouldn't do that. Well, listen, what kind of a shepherd would I be if I didn't warn you of the poison that's out there? He's astonished, Paul is. Man, these, these false teachers are disturbing these believers and they're distorting the truth of the gospel. There's the astonishment of Paul, but then there's the admonition of Paul. In verses 8 and 9, he talks about, first of all, the, the source of this false teaching. 
Paul's got a message to anybody that would pervert the gospel. Listen to what he says. He says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul is going to an extreme here to make his point. He said, listen, if I come back to you or if an angel from heaven even comes to you and preaches something other than the gospel, let them be accursed. Regardless of their credentials, regardless of the credentials of the messenger, if they change the message of the gospel and their teaching does not square with God-giving teaching, it is not of God. MacArthur said it this way, truth outranks the credentials of any teacher or preacher. Jack Andrews, a friend of mine that wrote a wonderful, wonderful series of sermons on Galatians said this, the criteria for accepting the message is not the credentials that they possess, but the content of their preaching. We've got institutes of higher learning all over America that are teaching religion classes by people that wouldn't know God if they got hemmed up with him in a broom closet. You say, Pastor, that, that's happening in institutes of higher learning every day. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because my child was in one of the classes that completely distorted the gospel of Jesus Christ because he wanted to make it more inclusive. You say, where's that at? Furman University. You say, you shouldn't call them out. I hope the president calls me. I hope they do. See, some people, y'all get nervous about that, I know. I'm going to tell you why I'm so passionate about this at the end of this message. There's the source of false teaching, but then there's the sentence to the false teachers. Watch what Paul says. You, you talk about not playing around. Watch what he says. He says, let him be accursed in the last part of verse 8. And then in verse 9, he says again. He says, look, I'm going to say it again. In case you didn't get it the first time, I want you to hear it the second time. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than what you've received, let him be accursed. Now that word accursed is a significant word. Paul is using some very strong language and he is not playing around here. He says these false teachers should be left in the hands of God to deal with the harshest of judgment. That word accursed means in the Greek anathema, which is to be devoted to destruction. Paul says these false teachers ought to be destroyed. They ought to burn forever separated from Christ. That's what he says about false teachers. Not me. I didn't say that. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did. Because Paul knows how false teaching is dangerous. And he wants to convince these Galatians to stick with the one true gospel because souls are at stake. The astonishment of Paul. The admonition of Paul. And then finally, notice with me, the aspiration of Paul. Look with me at verse 10. Paul asks a question. And then he answers it. He says, for do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul asks the question, he says, should I satisfy men? Now remember the Judaizers are trying to attack the man and his message. They accused Paul of putting aside all the Mosaic standards in order to make the gospel more appealing to the Gentiles. But Paul's going to make it very clear. His goal is not to satisfy man. His goal is not that he is trying to please man. Listen, Paul used to be a people pleaser. You remember when he was of the Pharisees? When, when he was persecuting the believers? He was trying to put a stop to this Christianity that was on the move? Paul said, there was a time I used to please man, but I'm not interested in pleasing man anymore because what I've discovered is when I please man, I'm not a servant of God. Paul had endured persecution. 
These folks that he's riding to, they knew the trouble that he had dealt with. He'd been stoned at Lystra, left for dead. He paid a price to see these folks because he cared about these people and he wanted them to understand the one true gospel. And Paul simply said, I'm not softening my message to make it more palatable to man. I'm gonna stick with the stuff. It'll be a good day in your life and in mine when we stop trying to please man. When you're sitting and talking with someone that is lost, the temptation is to soften the message. But souls are at stake. Eternities are at stake. And we must just stand as Paul tells us in chapter five on the gospel. Satisfy men? No. Pastors all across this country are trying to do that. They worry in their office week after week and day after day, are, are they happy with me? And if I could sit and talk to them, Brother Phil, I'd say, listen, it doesn't matter if they're happy with you. Because when you stand and preach and you teach and you counsel and you love your folks, here's what you're doing it for, an audience of one. I'm so thankful that I stand in a church today. It never crosses my mind to soften the the message. I don't feel pressure from a church to soften the message. I just stand up here, preach the truth of the Word of God, and let the chips fall where they may. Because listen, we're here for an audience of one. I told the first service, I've said this to you before, but there's pastors across the country, man, their their church just bought a new bus. And the senior adults are putting pressure on that pastor to put some new shocks on that thing so, so it will ride smooth as they ride up that mountain to Gatlinburg to watch the leaves change. There's another group of people that's putting pressure on that pastor because they got a new bus and and they want to lower it down, put some bigger wheels on it, some fat tires on it, and put some fluorescent lights up under it, and put a boom-boom system in it. And then there's another group in this church that wants to camouflage that thing, put a net around it, and use it as a duck blind. And the pastor don't know what to do because he's got his senior adults that's got their pants put all the way up under their arms, their young people that's got them down by their knees, and he's somewhere in the between trying to please everybody. It's true. And they feel the pressure. But listen to me. You're not trying to please man. You walk the walk of faith. You walk in 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 his steps and just understand that you are walking in an audience of one. And if he's pleased, what does it matter if anybody else is? Stand on the word of God and the one true gospel. It's worth it, church. I'm telling you, it's worth it. One day, we're gonna stand before God. And I'm telling you, you'll be glad you didn't back up. You'll be glad you didn't soften the message. You'll be glad you didn't try to please man. You'll be glad you served the Savior. So here's the invitation today. Are you saved by God's amazing grace? Have you experienced the pardon and forgiveness that comes with a new relationship with Jesus Christ? You see, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, here's what I want you to hear more than anything else. Jesus loves you. And because of your sin, you've been separated from a holy God. And you can't reconcile that. Jesus came to reconcile that. And he did it on the cross of Calvary by dying a death that he didn't deserve to die and taking our place. And he says, I love you. And through repentance and faith, you can come into relationship with me, bridge that gap, 
and know for sure that heaven would be your final destination. So across this worship center today, here's the question. I'm not, I'm not asking the person beside you, behind you, in front of you. I'm asking this question. If death knocked on your door today, do you know where your eternity would be? There's only one way. It's a narrow way. And it's through the door. And his name is Jesus. You say, Pastor, I'm here, man. That, that's me. You're talking, you're, you're talking right to me, Pastor. I don't know my eternity. What's next? That's me. In just a moment, we're going to stand to our feet. And when we do, I want you to just walk down the front, just like that young lady did in the first service. Put your hand in mine and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. We'll take the Word of God, show you how you can leave today knowing heaven is your final home. Secondly, how about we get in an altar today and say, Lord, give me the boldness to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those that need to hear. Help me not to allow culture to, to soften my message. Help me not, not to give in to what others would have me to say, but Lord, help me to be the true servant of you and give me boldness to stand. And Lord, help me not be, listen to me, help me to not be a people pleaser, but a servant of the Savior. As we stand to our feet, maybe this is the church God would have you to yoke up with. Maybe you need to get your baptism on the right side of your conversion. Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. You come as we sing.